Welcome back to our series on Expedition Yachts Part 3, which is primarily going to deal with the conversion vessels. We left off after World War II when the uh, Expedition Yachts uh, went to war. Not all of them came back. And while we've talked about yachts that were turned into warships, let's talk about this warship that was converted into a yacht. And the extraordinary man who had the vision to do this, who is probably the father of all conversions. The vessel was a Canadian-built fast frigate that was launched in 1943. It saw service in the North Atlantic, escorting convoys that were being preyed upon by German U-boats. The vessel also participated in the landings at Normandy on D-Day. But have a look at these specs and compare them to any of the larger mega yachts that are being built today. 283 feet, 20.5 knots of speed, 7,500 nautical miles of range, and a lot of room for passengers. After the war, like many of these ships, the Stormont was laid up and scheduled to go to the scrapper. But in 1954, this Greek ship owner came along and offered the Canadian government $34,000 for the Stormont, and they sold it. He spent $4 million on the conversion into a luxury yacht, and the rest is history. While other yachts previously had hosted monarchs and presidents, the Onassis yacht was a gathering spot for celebrities, Hollywood stars, and all the people that mattered during that time, if they were lucky enough to be invited. And owners today who strive to make their vessels unique will have trouble matching Onassis, who covered these bar stools with whale force. Fast forward to the 1970s, 1980s. There's a new generation of yachtsmen and they want to go to uh, far off places. And the important thing to know about that period, let's say 70s and 80s, the largest yachts that were coming out of Holland, uh, people like Fedship and Amels, and also out of Germany, with a few exceptions that are very notable, um, those vessels were about 50 meters max, so let's say 163 feet. There were very few yachts over 200 feet. Um, so the existing yacht builders really were not turning out boats that had any kind of uh, endurance to stay at sea for 30 days, for instance, or cross oceans uh, with fuel to spare. Um, and so these yachtsmen that were looking for vessels to go into uh, to go into this kind of service found these sort of vessels, which uh, were typically built in Holland or Germany. This is an offshore tug, but it's not like a tug boat you see in a harbor pushing big ships around. Um, these boats were used to haul other ships or barges or other pieces of heavy equipment out in the open ocean in every kind of weather and that they would have an extreme range of let's say 10,000, 8,000 miles um, that they could operate in uh, distant locations without uh, services. So they would have to have a machine shop on board, they'd have to have plenty of spares, they'd have a ship's hospital and some of them even had helipads so this is the generation the first generation of uh, what we today would call expedition yachts and, and, the, and the boats that we know as expedition yachts president nixon's secretary of the treasury was a yachtsman named william simon and he purchased this ocean going tug tasca was built as one vessel of three in a series by the Dutch builder J. and K. Smith. The vessel already had tremendous attributes to be a world cruiser with a 13,000 nautical mile range and a Lloyd's Polar Ice Class hull. But this is not to say that Atasca doesn't have a very refined and comfortable interior. Atasca made history as the first motor yacht to complete a 23-day voyage from west to east through the Northwest Passage. Four months after doing the Northwest Passage, Atasca was navigating Drake's Passage to Antarctica. From Antarctica, Atasca set a course for New Zealand and Polynesia. As it turns out, the long-range offshore salvage tug has been the chosen platform for conversion into expedition yachts in a number of cases. And in fact, some of the most renowned expedition yachts in the world are ex-salvage tugs some of which you will recognize here. As the 20th century was ending, the offshore oil industry was exploring, drilling, and building rigs further offshore in deeper and more treacherous waters. A new generation of offshore support and exploration vessels was born, and they were built by the dozens in shipyards all around the world. Backed by the nearly unlimited resources of big oil, 
New designs, new innovations, and new technologies were developed for this 21st century fleet of vessels. But over the last 20 years, whenever the price of oil would stay down for a sustained period, a number of these vessels would be laid up and even offered for sale at a fraction of their original cost to build. And so the next chapter in our story is about the conversion of the offshore support and offshore research vessels into expedition yachts. So typically these are very rugged uh, all-weather vessels. They have uh, a number of redundant systems, fully functional heli decks with hangers. The one we're going to look at here is propelled by diesel electric uh, connected to Rolls-Royce Azipods that deliver a very respectable 16 knots maximum speed. Owner is an American billionaire who is no newbie to conversions or expeditions. This was his first vessel, the Aleutia. They brought the ship to the Daman shipyard in Holland and the Hollywood film director James Cameron is also involved and so this explains uh, the stylish interior with a full film studio and a lot of other uh, very cool features. So below this video there's a link uh, that you can click on to find out more about this amazing uh, state-of-the-art expedition vessel. This vessel, you know, we've all been probably reading about it in the magazines over the last couple of years. It's a conversion of a commercial uh, offshore supply vessel. In particular, this one is not just ice class, it's an actual ice breaker. Now, you got to understand the difference between ice breaker and ice class. Um, ice class means that the hull is reinforced up to a certain amount of uh, ice, and the vessel uh, should uh, basically can push around little pieces of ice or very thin ice. An ice breaker is rated to go into uh, serious ice and it doesn't just push it aside. It rides up on top of it and it uses the uh, weight of the vessel to crack the ice and crunch it up. And then the propellers uh, will actually uh, chop up the ice further and these propellers are so rugged that you can run if you get in a jam like an ice jam <laughs> you can hit it you can hit reverse and back up and these propellers will actually uh chop up the ice into chunks and you can <laughs> power around in reverse just using them like a you know a huge blender to chop up the ice and this vessel apparently was laid up in holland not far from the icon shipyards so um it went into the shed in 2017. So the main thing that they wanted to that they needed to accomplish, uh, first of all, they made the decision to keep the pilot house and keep the uh, the forward working part of the vessel intact, and that's a very big decision to make um, in doing a conversion because you have to overcome the fact that it's starting with a profile that's not great in terms of you know compared to a beautiful yacht and and you've got to uh, deal with that profile if you're going to keep the pilot house and keep all the uh, existing works which is a smart thing to do because uh, just moving it is very expensive and you're not adding anything to the capabilities of the vessel so um, so they made that decision at the outset and then designed around that existing forward pilot house uh, to make a, quite a, a good looking uh, and uh, meaningful profile on the vessel and, and also to keep its seaworthiness and its uh, ballast and weight proportions correct. So this sort of conversion uh, right away you know you're going to need a uh, certified helipad. In this case it was for an EC-145 Eurocopter. Uh, and with that, uh, if you're going to have endurance, you've got to have refueling uh, for the helicopter and all the uh, fire precautions. Another decision is to keep the deck heights the way they are, because if you're going to extend off the back of the existing pilot house, you're going to have to go with those deck heights. And these pods are Wardzilla electric pods. They're 1750 kilowatts each. And these are not just your regular sort of... Uh, go across the med pods. These are designed to churn ice. Aft of the main pilot house superstructure is where all your guest accommodations go. But they managed to uh, design in an owner's deck that has a forward-facing observation lounge and an open-air foredeck terrace, which is really cool. So this is right under the pilot house and uh, where guests and the owner can get out and really see what's going on. And I believe that's David Seal there looking good. Hello, David. So I'm glad to see that they did not go to a yacht uh, fairing and glossy finish. It has a commercial paint finish. This is very 
practical and it means that you can repaint uh, the crew can repaint the vessel any place that they happen to be and need to do some touch ups. So I'll put links below to these other videos so you can uh, check out uh, these other aspects of the boat and I don't want to cover the same ground. Uh, Burgess did this uh, very sexy uh, James Bondish um, treatment of the vessel with a very pretty actress here and um, so you can check that out and, and uh, explore the sort of fantasy life that uh, could be enjoyed on this vessel. And the only other comment I have is about the big bow here that they have on board. Uh, this thing is a quite a little monster. These things are made in Russia and uh, they look like they're just custom made to destroy nature. I don't really know what they have it on board for but I, I hope they don't go and do any of the things that it's advertised to be able to do. <laughs> Here I found it on the garbage channel. <laughs> anyway I hope that people will uh, get in their kayaks and uh, go uh, cross-country skiing instead but um, there you have it. So there you have a quick rundown of the earliest conversions and the latest and greatest conversions. And I hope you'll join me for part four in this series where we're going to deal with new build expedition yachts and see what's going on. It's quite incredible. <laughs>